Good morning. I hope you all are fine. <coughs> See, in the last clip, I talked about uh, John Crow Ransom and uh, Robert Penn Warren. And uh, <coughs> today, I'm going to talk about two more critics, Alan Tate and uh, Clint Brooks. So let us talk about Alan Tate first. Uh, you all know that uh, Alan Tate is, is, you know, he is a leading figure of new criticism and he is basically known for his concept of tension in poetry. Now, Alan Tate says that uh, tension plays a decisive role in poetry. As irony plays a decisive role in poetry, as, as ambiguity plays a decisive role in poetry, in the same way, Tension also plays a decisive role in poetry. Fine. He feels that, that the principle of tension, it, it sustains the whole structure of meaning. Then uh, regarding the origin of this word, tension, you know, he says that uh, he, he, I mean, he talks about it in his work, tension in poetry. I mean, this is the work written by Alan Tate and that is tension in poetry. So in this work he declares that, uh, that he derives the term tension by removing the prefixes from the two terms extension and intention. Now if you remove the prefixes from the two words extension and, and intention then you know the word that will remain you know it will be tension. Fine. So, he feels that extension and intention, you know, they, they, they define the abstract and, and denotative and concrete and connotative aspects of the poetic language. I hope you are getting the point. So, regarding the origin of this word tension, he says that, uh, you know, he derives the term tension by removing the, the prefixes from you know, extension and intention and the two words, you know, they define the abstract and denotative and concrete and connotative aspects of the poetic language, right? Now, Tate feels that, that the meaning of a poem, it is the full organized body of all the extension and intention that we can find in it. Fine. Now try to understand what is extension and, and what is intention. See, uh, extension basically it, it refers to, to extensive or logical or denotative meaning in poetry. Getting my point. And it, it basically refers to literal meaning. Means it basically refers to precise and, and literal meaning. Fine. And intention, uh, it refers to, to the intensive or connotative or suggestive meaning of poetry. Means it, it refers to metaphorical meaning. I hope you are getting the difference between the two, extension and intention. Fine. So extension basically, it, it refers to literal meaning and intention, it, it refers to metaphorical meaning, connotative meaning or suggestive meaning of poetry. Fine. Now you will see that, that there is an infinite line between, between extreme extension and extreme intention and the readers select the meaning according to their personal choices or approaches or interests. I mean they, they, they they find the meanings according to their own choices. They select the meaning or meanings according to their personal choices. Right. Now say for example, you know, a, a Platonist. You know, a Platonist while reading uh, to his poem stress. You know, this is a poem written by Andrew Marvel. Right. So a Platonist while reading to his poem stress, you know, this, this Platonist may state that uh, this poem is an invitation to young people to behave immorally. Uh, 
Holmes, you know, the speaker of the poem, how he is trying to persuade the lady and you know, you know very well what, what he is trying to get from the lady. Uh, he is not trying to get love from the side of the lady, rather he is trying to get, you know, lust from the side of, of lady. And the way he uses the language, I mean the syllogism that, that he displays there in the poem, this is remarkable, right? So, a Platonist, while reading this poem, I mean to his coy mistress, he may say that, that this poem is an invitation to young people to behave immorally. Fine. And thus, you know, he would like to ban this poem. He would like to censor this, this poem. Because this poem, according to him, is, is you know, a kind of poem which is, which is giving, a, a, you know, bad message to young people or which is turning them into immoral people, right? But this is the one side of tension in the poem. The other side of tension in the poem is that it deals with, with human predicament. And what is that human predicament? That is the conflict between sensuality and, and ascetism. Ascetism. Right? So I hope tension, I mean the concept of tension is, is clear to you people. So to elentate, a metaphysical poet may begin at or uh, you know, he may begin at or, or near the extensive end, E-N-D, end. Getting my point, I repeat again, you know, Alan Tate feels that, that a metaphysical poet, he may begin at or near the extensive end, E-N-D, end. And on the other hand, a romantic or a symbolist, he may begin at or near the intensive end means a metaphysical poet may, may, you know, go for precise and literal meaning. But on the other hand, a romantic or a symbolist, you know, he may go for connotative or, or suggestive meaning. Fine. So, I hope the idea is very clear to you people and this is something about Alan Tate. Now, the other critic is, uh, you know, Clint Brooks. Fine. And you know very well that he's a key figure in the rise of uh, the school of new criticism in, in America. And he was basically impacted by T.S. Eliot, I. Richards, F.R. Lewis and, and William Empson. Fine. Now if you talk about Clint Brooks, uh, you will find that, that as a critic, uh, he is known for his formula of paradox. And uh, you know, with this with this paradox, he he identifies he identifies the special characteristic of literary language. Fine. So with the help of this this paradox, he he identifies the special characteristic or uh, the special feature of literary language. Fine. Now, as uh, you know, I. Richards, as Richards had emotive. And William Empson had ambiguity to find a special kind of meaning in literary language. In the same way, you know, Brooks does it with the formula of ambiguity and, and paradox. I mean, with the help of, you know, paradox and, and ambiguity, you know, he tries to find a special kind of meaning in literary language. Right? Now you will find that as a new critic, he, he made a revolution in, in the teaching of poetry in America. And at one point of time, he became very famous in, in America. Because he made new innovations in, in the teaching of poetry in America. Right? Now his well-known works are, uh, I'll be talking about two works only. The Well-Wrote Urn. And the other is modern poetry and the tradition. Fine. Now, in these two works, uh, Clint Brooks states that that ambiguity and paradox they are they are central to understand poetry. Means, if you want to understand poetry, then you need to take the help of ambiguity and and paradox. Fine. Then he says that that metaphor is the nub of uh, you know poetry. Why? 
simply because it, it links the concrete with abstract and universal elements in it. Fine. So, to him, metaphor is the very essence of poetry because it, it links the concrete with abstract and universal elements in it. Then he says that, uh, you know, uh, this, this metaphor, it, it differentiates poetry from the language of science. Uh, if you want to make a difference between the language of science and, and the language of poetry, you can do it with the help of metaphor. In, in poetic language, you can find a metaphor, but in scientific language, you cannot find a metaphor, right? Now, Brooks, basically, he, he focused on, on the interior life of a poem and, and he codified the principles of close reading. Close reading. Now, what does it mean? It simply means that, that he focused on textual analysis and the autonomy of literature. Means he focused on, on textual analysis and he also said that literature, you know, was autonomous. Is that clear? Then if you remember, you know, he wrote an essay, The, the Formalist Critic. Now, this is the name of the essay written by him. Now, in it, he, he exemplified the tenets of new criticism. Now, what are those, those tenets? Now, you know, these are very special and try to understand them one by one. So, the first tenet given by him is, is you know, he says that uh, uh, literary criticism, it is description and evaluation of its, its object. Fine. Then uh, the second point is, I mean, he says that, that the primary concern of criticism is with the problem of unity, which, which the literary work forms or fails to form. I repeat, listen to me seriously. He says that the primary concern of criticism is with the problem of unity, which the literary work forms or fails to form and the relation of the various parts to each other in forming this unity. Fine. Then the, then the other point given by him is, uh, you know, he says that, that in a good work, form and content, they cannot be separated. Form cannot be separated with, with uh, form cannot be separated from content. Right. Then the next point is that form is meaning. Form is meaning. Fine. So whatever meaning you have to find out that is in the form. So form is meaning. Right. Then he says that, that you know, literature is ultimately metaphorical and, and symbolic. Means literature is ultimately metaphorical and, and symbolic. It is it is different from the, the ordinary speech because in the ordinary speech you cannot find the display of metaphors and symbols but in literary language you can find a, a display of metaphors and symbols. So to him literature is ultimately metaphorical and symbolic and that's why it's different from the day-to-day -day speech or from the ordinary speech. Fine. Then the other point given by him is that he says that, that literature is not, not a surrogate for, for religion. Now this is a beautiful point. Literature is not a surrogate for religion. Means literature cannot be a substitute for religion. It means the purpose of literature is not religious preaching. Fine. And he elaborates it further in the next point when he says that, that specific moral problems are the subject matter of literature, but the purpose of literature is not to point a moral. Now try to understand specific moral problems. They may be the subject matter of literature. They can be pointed out, you know, through, through literary texts, but the purpose of a literary text is not to point a moral. Fine. Then, you know, the next one is uh, the principles of literary criticism. 
they define the area relevant to, to literary criticism they don't give a method to carry out the criticism fine so they simply define the area relevant to literary criticism but they do not give a method to carry out the criticism fine then uh, you know in his in his book the well wrote urn in this book you know brooks used a term and the term is the heresy of paraphrase the heresy of paraphrase now what does it mean it means that poetry should be taught as poetry and a critic should not try to reduce a poem to simple paraphrase fine that poetry should be taught as poetry and a critic should not try to reduce a poem to simple paraphrase and he should not explain it through biographical or historical contexts fine then there is a literary critic susan sontag susan sontag this critic says i mean this critic calls this activity as as a philistinism of interpretation which activity means if you try to reduce a poem to simple paraphrase so it will be a kind of it will be a kind of you know philistinism of interpretation according to susan sontag i hope you are getting the point fine so the fact is that a critic should not try to reduce a poem to simple paraphrase and at the same time he should not try to explain it through biographical or historical contexts fine and if you try to reduce a poem to simple paraphrase then according to susan sontag you know it is a kind of activity that is philistinism of interpretation philistinism of interpretation i hope you are getting it fine then brooks says that uh, through irony paradox ambiguity and other poetic devices you know a poet can resist any any reduction of a poem to a paraphrasable core getting my point means if you use such poetic devices like like irony paradox ambiguity and and some other poetic devices then uh, you know you can resist any kind of any kind of reduction of a poem to to you know a paraphrasable core fine then if you remember in his essay the language of paradox this is another essay written by him the language of paradox now brooks proves that uh, you know paradox is the language appropriate and, and inevitable to poetry fine so he says that paradox is the language that is appropriate and inevitable to to poetry now say for example you know if you go through canonization written by john ton you know in this poem we find a paradoxical statement and and it it states that uh, i'm quoting a line from the poem secular lovers are saints secular lovers are saints so this you know this is a kind of paradox and this paradox in this poem it makes the poem an an immortal piece of literature today you remember canonization just because it has it has you know it has this this paradox what is the paradox the paradox is in the line that is secular lovers are saints fine so this paradox makes this this poem an immortal piece of literature fine then uh, brooks talks about irony also and he says that uh, irony also plays a decisive role like like paradox fine and you know as as richard says about irony that that it brings in the opposite complementary impulses to to achieve a balanced poise fine this is said by i a richards about irony he says that it brings in the opposite complementary impulses to achieve a balanced poise so irony to richards and brooks and other new critics you know this this irony that that they talk about you know this is not verbal irony but this is situational irony 
this is not verbal irony but this is situational irony so the fact is that uh, most of the critics including I. E. Richards and Glenn Brooks you know they talk about not verbal irony but they talk about situational irony right now what is verbal irony see verbal irony is the difference between what is said and what is meant uh, you know some uh, what is said is is quite different to what is meant so this is the difference between what is said and what is meant say for example uh, if in in if in the severe uh, winter season uh, you say that it is too hot to go out <laughs> so this is an example of verbal irony means if in severe you know winter season you say that it is too hot, T double O, too hot to go out means it is so hot that I, I cannot go out. So this is an example of verbal irony because here the difference is, you know, that of what is said and what is meant. Fine. Then situational, situational irony, you know, it, it reveals the paradoxical essence. Getting my point? Situational irony, it reveals the paradoxical essence. Now, it has been defined by Clint Brooks in The Well Wrote Urn. And in this book, I mean The Well Wrote Urn, Brooks defines situational irony as a critical term, which means, you know, recognition of incongruities in poetry. Recognition of incongruities in poetry. That is from, you know, incongruous means that is not in harmony fine uh, you know this is something you can say that uh, uh, when when things don't match as as they are expected getting my point so i'm talking about incongruities so you can define it by saying that when things don't match as as they are expected say for example you know if you say a wealthy woman drives an old car so this is this is an example of you know incongruity incongruity i mean the things are not in harmony right so uh, you can also clarify it in in uh, you know to his coemistress to his coem then uh, i can give you some more examples of situational irony uh, you know situational irony uh, uh, so many so many you know examples you can you can quote from from the day-to-day -day life say for example if you say a marriage counselor files for a divorce <laughs> so this is an example of situational irony if you say that uh, the police station uh, you know it got robbed so again this is this is an example of situational irony fine and uh, if you say that, that the teacher fails the test, so once again, this is an example of situational irony. And today, you know, <clears throat> sanitizer is being sanitized. So again, this may be an example of situational irony. Getting my point. So it's a critical term according to Brooks, which means, you know, a recognition of incongruities in, in poetry fine and uh, you know this situational irony you can find in in the ironic tone of to his to his coemistress also fine so you can go through the poem and at a number of points you can find this 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 irony particularly you know at one point when he says that today i am young and you are beautiful and tomorrow you will not remain beautiful and i will not remain young and tomorrow we will sail towards the grave. We will sail towards the grave. Okay, grave is a fine place. It is a nice place to, to love. But we cannot even, we cannot even, you know, sit there properly. Fine. So this is the nice example of, you know, situational army. I hope uh, Brooks is clear to you. Uh, you need to take some pain in order to understand Clint Brooks. So please uh, listen to the clip somehow seriously and note down every point. Um, thank you. If you have some queries, you can ask. And uh, uh, 
uh, i'll be finishing uh, i'll be finishing this this uh, you know nucleotide or these nucleotides uh, in one more clip and then we'll be we'll be sailing towards a new theory thank you and good day good morning i hope you all are fine <clears throat>